Hey y'all, it's Pastor Mina here. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being here. If you're catching this in real time, then it is Easter season. Easter's among us. He is risen. He is mighty. His resurrection power is here in the room, in your house, in your car, wherever you are, just waiting to be beheld. He wants to be known. And so I'm so glad that you're here so we can seek after his heart and get to know his character through his word. But first things first, I wanted to let y'all know that it is the month of April 2022, and that means that we have our He is Risen Spring Women's Retreat coming up. It is by Church of Daniel through our women's ministry, Women of Peace. And so if you're not aware of that, it is a three-day retreat taking place in New Jersey. It's in person. We're going to be worshiping, fellowshipping, laying hands praying over one another and there's also going to be um, activities and refreshments will be included so if you are in the new jersey area if you know somebody up in the northeast or if you have the means to get there then we would love to see you we would love to be in godly community with you in person also next month in may 2022 we have our second mission trip coming up by the grace and the glory of god we'll be returning back to puerto rico we have a partnership with cree women's center there and so we'll be pouring love and pouring god's love specifically into expecting mothers their unborn babies and even babies that have been born it's an amazing center, Cree is an amazing center that offers support for women throughout their pregnancy and years after the children are born. So check the description below for donation items that we are accepting. And we're also accepting monetary donations and prayer as usual. Please pray for us that we would be able to clearly discern the will of God with each person's lives, right? That are put before us and that we have in front of us to serve. We want all of God and none of us. We want him to increase and us to decrease. So prayer over that is always appreciated. But wherever you are and however you are, I hope this video is finding you well. I'm glad that you're here. If you're new here, then thank you for being here. Once again, please do subscribe, comment, like the video. Let me know what's up with you. What can I be praying about concerning you? And if you're returning, thank you so much for coming back. I'm glad that you love it here because <laughs> I do too. So as always, I want to start off with prayer and then we'll be getting into the word of God. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, we come before you right now. Mm. I feel the power of the living God, of the risen King Jesus right now. We thank you for your glory. We make space for you to speak. We make space for you to move. We're listening. Speak, Lord, because we are listening. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We just ask for your accuracy and your precision right now, Lord, in this hour, in whatever you're calling your children to do, that we would do it in exactly the way that you would have us to do it, right? For your glory alone, God. For me right now in my house, Lord, I just profess that we serve you. We will serve you even when it doesn't make earthly sense, even if it may cause us earthly embarrassment because of the risk that we have to take and the sacrifices that we have to make. Lord, you're worthy and you're worth it. You're worthy of it all. Thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much that you went to the cross to die for us. We will never forget that sacrifice. You made the ultimate sacrifice. And right now we have space to love one another and to love you because you first loved us. Hallelujah. Thank you for your strengthening, your quickening, Lord, and your edifying that you're doing in us through your word and through this community. Lord, what you're doing is so big and it's so vast and it's so grand. We could never be worthy of your forgiveness and your mercy and your generosity, but you pour it over us daily. And we thank you. We thank you that you woke us up this morning. We thank you for the resources to be gathering here right now in your presence, Lord. So right now we adore you, we blow kisses to you, we worship you, Jesus, hallelujah. It's in your precious name that I pray. Thank you, Lord, for going before us. Amen. So we're going to be, whew, come on, Holy Spirit. We're going to be in Exodus 14 today. We're talking about the Israelites. We're talking about Moses. And we're specifically in this moment where God is calling his people to cross the Red Sea. 
So if you are somebody who is in a season of transition right now, and if you're not and you're here, then buckle up, Buttercup, because you might be entering one soon. <laughs> but this is for you, okay? Hallelujah. So I'm going to start off by just reading the word and we'll get into this entire bag <laughs> as I do that. In Exodus 14 and 1, it says, Then the Lord says to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Phi Haroth, okay, between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. Let's pause right there, <laughs> okay? Because there are principalities. This is like a really biblical churchy word, right? But it means powers. There are powers, right? Spiritual powers. And this can be embodied by people or it can be literally in the spirit. But there are principalities, right, that the evil one has set up against God's people, right? And as you are following in obedience the word from God, right, as you're taking the steps that he's calling you to take in the order, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, for divine order, in the exact order and the divine timing that he's calling you to take them, there are principalities that the enemy sets up that says, uh, look at look at these little Israelites. Look at these children of God. Look at her. Look at him. He confused. They must be confused. They're wandering around in the desert looking confused. And see, this is a moment where God gives us information on the hallelujah. So because he loves us, because he's our friend, because he's our husband man, he has our back. Okay. And he wants us to get the full picture. He doesn't want us to actually walk around in confusion. And so through his word, right, in four, in Exodus 14, verses one and two and three, he's giving us clarity onto this is what's going on behind the backs of the Israelites and people are muttering and there's gossip taking place, hallelujah. And so when you're walking in obedience to God, yeah, it's gonna look to earthly, unfaithful people as if you're confused. They, there might be embarrassment, right? The spirit of embarrassment that tries to rise up against you, right? Through this gossip of the mouths of these people, right? That the enemy is able to use. And they see the spirit of God resting on you and it upsets, right? That dwelling place inside them that the unclean spirit, hallelujah, has taken. It upsets that spirit to see the spirit of God resting upon you. And so they use unfruitful words out of their mouths to come up against you. This is how principalities work, right? So jumping back into the word, they must be confused. They all stuck in the desert like, ugh. Make it make sense. Pity them. Pity on them, right? Jumping into verse four, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Hallelujah. So just being clear, this is the first time that the Lord says in this passage, I will gain glory for myself. And we're, we're paying attention to that. We're marking his words because this is the heart of God toward the situation. And so if it's important to God, it's important to us. And this is his first time stating that intention, right? So we're taking mental note of that, but also take mental note of the fact that God says, I, the Lord, will harden Pharaoh's heart toward them come on come on because if you've been in a situation right where a principality is rising against you you must know that the lord hardened their hearts to you uh-oh because we want to thank god for his sovereignty right and we want to profess his power but what about when that means hallelujah that he's sovereign and he's powerful over pharaoh huh why would the Lord harden Pharaoh's heart toward his beloved, right? 
Because with that, when, when someone, when a principality, right? When someone in power is hardened toward you, how many of you know that that's not gonna, it's not gonna be easy for you to get out of that situation by earthly standards, okay? Let, let's keep reading. The Israelites were obedient. Verse five says, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their service. Hmm, hmm. So to Pharaoh, the Israelites are only what they can produce. Come on, somebody. Their only value, their only identity, according to Pharaoh, is their service to him. That's how principalities work. It's transactional. It's what can I get out of you, right? He's not seeing the Israelites as God's chosen people as they are, but the truth still remains, okay? And so this is just for somebody who is in transition, right? Who principalities, right, are seeking to identify you by your service and your your production value, but God knows and God sees you as so much more than this. Hallelujah. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. Uh-oh. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers all over them. So for this, this little group of Israelites, so for these, these little Israelites and Moses, Pharaoh got together all this the entire host okay odds are stacked in an earthly sense from an earthly evaluation the odds are stacked against the israelites the lord hardened the heart of pharaoh king of egypt and so he pursued the israelites who were marching out boldly march boldly come on verse 9 the egyptians all pharaoh's horses and chariots horsemen and troops pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Harith, opposite Baal Zephon. And so again, we're just seeing, right, that God's word, even before the miracle, come on, before the miracle is even performed, God's word is coming to pass, right? Because he said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Check. He said to Moses, Bring your people here. This is the territory that I have for them, right by the sea. Check. God is still in control. Hallelujah. Verse 10 says, As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? Mm. What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Mm -mm, Y'all, I'm, I'm really, I'm trying to leave it alone because that's not even the message that I prepared in the secret place. But know that when you are moving in complete obedience, hallelujah, there will be times as much as we as you know, church folk want to scoff at the Egyptians, at the Israelites for romanticizing slavery in Egypt. If I hope we have a real church in the house, because if you've been right in this movement, right in this rhythm with God, where you're moving in his obedience, there are times, period, there are times where you feel as though he's brought you so far and you still may die there. It's going to feel like that because God requires everything from us, right? He called his only son whom he loved to give the ultimate sacrifice. So what does that say for us as followers of Jesus, right? That, yeah, you are going to have to die to yourself. Talking about the new man that's being born in you, right? That, that this is valid, that the Israelites would ask Moses, right? As silly as it sounds, because that's not the character of our God to bring us this far to leave us. That's never been who he is to not fulfill his promise. That's just not on his resume. And that's not what the scoreboard reflects. It does feel that way sometimes because we are human and we're imperfect and we have flesh minds, 
right? And flesh hearts. And so that means that sometimes our thoughts don't reflect the grace and the glory before us. And so this is where the Israelites find themselves. But listen to what Moses, man of God, says in verse 13. He answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Ah, the Egyptians will see you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. <laughs> come on, come on. Do I have a shouting church up in here? Leave a comment if I got a praise in church up in here. The, these people you worried about, she ain't even going to see them no more. <laughs> they can't even come where you're going, baby. And you think they're going to kill you? Absolutely not. You, you won't even see him after today. Come on. Come on. This is for somebody who needs that encouragement. Know that you will not even see these Egyptians anymore. Come on. The Lord will fight for you. Not you will fight for you. Uh-oh. Because <laughs> how many of you know that sometimes before we get saved, we may like to fight, right? <laughs> with our words, with our fists, whatever it may be. But it doesn't say we will fight for ourselves. It doesn't say we're really good at fighting and so we'll make it through this. Hallelujah. Exodus 14 and 14. The Lord will fight for you. And so as children of God, we're like, okay, so God, you're fighting for me. What do I need to do then? Moses makes it plain and clear. This is why I love him. You need only to be still and it, this is so simple yet it's so profound because fight or flight is real <laughs> trauma is real and so if we can't fight because the lord is fighting for us then a lot of times we want to flee hallelujah but the lord said abide in me come on he said if you would just abide in me if you would just be still and know that i am god right then he would work it out and you would you would have the staying power and the wisdom to see it through to completion exactly where he placed you in safety. You don't have to run. You don't have to flee. Just be still. You need only to be still. You, you don't need to go out and apply for different jobs and different programs. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm definitely talking to myself. You don't have to come out of your character, right? You don't have to go back to Egypt. You need only to be still. You need only to be still, hallelujah. Now to me, this is where it gets really gangsta. <laughs> Verse 15, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? <laughs> Tell the Israelites to move on. This is a whole word because our God is so compassionate, right? And he is so emotionally intelligent, right? He created emotions. He's the God of our emotions, our hearts, our minds. Like he knows. Jesus wept, child. He knows, right? He is empathetic to what we go through. He is aware of what we go through and he is aware of the specific challenges within our walk with him. But here he's saying, why are you crying? Why are you crying? <laughs> and, you know, I don't know if this is hitting for y'all the same way it's hitting for me, but God is my father. And I one thing I'm going to go do is run and tell my father. <laughs> one thing I'm going to do is cry to my dad, okay? <laughs> I de Like when my feelings get hurt, when I'm overwhelmed, when I feel like whatever it is, when I'm overwhelmed with joy even, like whatever it is, I'm going to cry to my God. OK, he, he's he's wiped plenty of tears off his face. But here he's saying as much as as much as he has space for our emotions, as much as he welcomes the breath of our full emotional lives, he's saying here, why are you even crying? Move on. And that's for somebody. And that's from a compassionate, loving, emotionally intelligent God. Why are you crying? Just move on. I, I want to stay here. I want to stay here and fuss with it for a second because our minds, I don't know about y'all, but there maybe, maybe it's the church down the street, but we can get so fixated and we can get so obsessed and we can get so anxious about situations and people, right? 
and battles that are before us that we begin to worship them hallelujah how many of you know that your anxiety right and that situation and that little funk that people got with you that can become an idol when you obsess over it because it takes up so much space within you that it actually pushes God out did you know that that you obsessing over what they said to you and how they said it and how they looked at you and how it made you feel can actually become an idol and you can begin to worship the devil by focusing and fixating on it because that was a snare set by him right by satan he did that to make you doubt yourself but God is fighting for you anyway. So why focus on it? Why cry? Why not just move on? Why not just move? It doesn't, not everything deserves your acknowledgement and certainly not your precious mental and emotional and spiritual energy. Okay? Hallelujah. Whew. Verse 16 says, raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea. Mm to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. If Moses was stuck crying to God and not moving on, he would have missed the action that God needed him to take to free not only himself, but everyone connected to him. Come on. You, you know, the, the legacy of this moment is what we stand upon today as believers of Jesus Christ. And it could have been stolen by something petty, by something petty that, that occupied Moses' mind to the point where he could no longer hear God. If that happened, he wouldn't have been able, if he was so fixated on what happened yesterday, if he was so focused on the past and, and what ain't he said, then he would have missed the part where he needed to raise his staff to part the ocean because he had it in his hands the whole time as oh hallelujah thank you holy spirit thank you holy spirit as the israelites are looking at moses some type of way as if he didn't really hear from god and he's not the divine leader that he is and this is taking place as pharaoh is looking at the israelites as if they're not guided by god all of this is happening and the whole time Moses is holding the the instrument that held the deliverance power in his hand. What do you have in your hands right now that you're missing? You're missing what's in your hand because you're focused on what they said to you yesterday. Come on now. And, and this is not to shame anybody, but don't let it distract you a day longer. Don't let it distract you a day longer, right? Because it could turn into 40 years real quick. It could turn into a lifetime real quick of obsession on past trauma. But what you have in your hands, hallelujah. The Lord placed prophetic deliverance, healing power in our hands. And he also places specific instruments of the same in our hands because he loves us. So I don't know who I'm talking to, but you painter, you poet, <laughs> hallelujah, you homemaker, right? You handyman, you craftsman. There, there is somebody connected to this message that there are instruments in your hand right now that hold the deliverance for you and everyone connected to you. But you have to let go of what they said about you first. Hallelujah. Verse 17, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, okay? Remember, God had a plan. God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. So they will go in after them. And again, he's saying, remember we took mental note of his heart toward the situation. And here he go, come again, saying it the second time. I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when third time he's stating it. I will gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. 
when God repeats something, first of all, when God says something, it's for us. It's not for him, right? Because he's God. He, he don't need to, he don't need words in order to be glorious. But he's saying it for us. And this statement is so important to him that he said it three times in one chapter. That he will gain the glory through all of this. Literally through everything going on right here. This is like one of the most popular stories in the Bible. And he did this miracle to gain glory. We're early in the book. So this, this whole book is a glory book. But we're in the beginning because he is showing us from Jump Street that he is glorious. So when you pray, right, and you're praying the promises of God, and when you seek and you're seeking the heart of God, know that it's in his character to be glorious. <laughs> Hallelujah. So with the instruments in your hand, with the, with the ideas in your heart that you believe have come from him, of praying in agreement and affirmation that it's for his glory. Come on, somebody. I hope you're catching this because what he will do to gain glory is part the Red Sea in your life. And I am skipping ahead. <laughs> but you've probably heard this story before, so I hope I didn't spoil it. There is no limit to what God will do to gain glory in your life. He delights in it. It's his pleasure. It's his pleasure to gain glory through the faithful. Hallelujah. Now, verse 19 says, Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Mm, hallelujah. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. Okay, get a visual. There's an angel of the Lord on a pillar of a cloud in between the army of Israel and the army of Egypt. And he's pushing out light and pushing out darkness on either side of himself because this is how adaptable and how agile and how equipped our God is. Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. So neither went near the other all night long. And now if y'all, I know there's somebody on here because I know I got a real church on here that have been through some things, that have been through some dark nights, that, that maybe I'm feeling this prophetically, that maybe had to sleep outside some nights. But how many of you know that he will keep you? His keeping power, it doesn't go away when the sun goes down. Hallelujah. But he will keep you on the side of lightness through the night so that nothing will touch you through the entire night because that's how kind our God is that he doesn't leave you behind he doesn't forget you right when others do and I want to fool with this a little more because in verse 19 it says the angel of God had already been traveling so again as all this is going down as the Israelites are looking at Moses like uh, boy, are you even anointed? And as the Pharaoh's looking at the Israelites, like, are y'all even chosen? The whole time the angel of the Lord had gone before them, the angel of the Lord had gone before them, that they wouldn't, they wouldn't be confused as Pharaoh thought, that they wouldn't be aimlessly wandering through the wilderness. No, the whole time they were guided by the angel of the Lord. And jumping back to Exodus 13, verses 21 to 23, it says, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire and give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So you want to talk about provision? This is before the rah-rah even started. And I'm talking about chapter 14 is the rah-rah. Chapter 14 is where it starts getting really real. Before that even started, hallelujah, the Lord had an angel sitting on a pillar with fire by night and guidance for them. 
And the same goes for you. I'm prophetically declaring this over you, children of Yahweh. That there is an angel just sitting on a cloud before you, right? And that you know how to listen to God. And he knows how to speak to you. And you are guided. This is just confirmation for somebody. That even when Pharaoh say that you looking good and crazy right now. <laughs> And that even when you yourself want to question your journey, that there is an angel of the Lord guiding you by day and night. And I would even go as far as to say that this angel has been guiding you longer than you're even aware, because that's how sovereign our God is. Verse 21 of chapter 14 of Exodus says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind <laughs> and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and withdrew it into confusion. Hallelujah. We're going to pause right there just to point out the fact that this is the Old Testament. And, you know, I love the Bible, so I really want to make this clear for those of us that maybe are not that familiar with this holy text yet. But this is before the birth of Jesus Christ. And I had somebody challenge me recently and say that Jesus was never mentioned in the Old Testament. And it made me kind of sad for this person because they were an elder and they believed that. But the Old Testament is here for the same reason that we are here as believers, and that's to point to Jesus. That's the only reason it's here. And so right here, as God is directing the wind and directing the waves, that is a foreshadowing for the glorious, risen, mighty son of man that's to come. Because how many of you remember that that's what Jesus did, right? He, he was sleeping on the boat and his disciples were so fearful. They were like, how are you sleeping at such a time as this? And he said, ye of little faith, what do you mean? If, and what he meant is that if he is here, then glory is here and there's nothing that can harm them. And what he did was command the wind and waves to be still and the storm stopped. So there's no wasted ink in the Bible and all of the Bible is Jesus. He is the living word. And so this scripture specifically is very early in the Bible. It's in Exodus and it points to the majesty of Jesus that's to come. Hallelujah. Jumping down to verse 25. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving hallelujah and the Egyptians said let's get away from the Israelites the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt who glory 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 because first of all this is our anchor <laughs> this is our anchor scripture for this sermon the Lord is binding the wheels hallelujah the Lord is binding the wheels of the chariots of confusion. The Lord is binding the wheels of the chariots of doubt. The Lord is binding the wheels of the chariots of harm. The Lord is binding the wheels of the chariots of darkness in this world and in your life today. Hallelujah. And not only that, but at this point, you have the Egyptians speaking the word of the Lord that was given to Moses back to the Israelites. What? That's how powerful God is? That he can command the lips of not only his servants who gladly serve him, right? But the those on earth that oppose his children. Hallelujah. Moses told the Israelites the Lord will fight for them. And here in the middle of the parted Red Sea, you have the Egyptians saying, the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Let's flee. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord is binding the wheels of that affliction in your life. The Lord is binding the wheels and clogging the wheels of that addiction. Hallelujah. The Lord is binding the wheels of generational curses. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ooh, if you have it in you and if you're able, give him a stomp and a shout right now, church, because he is binding it for you. He's not only fighting for you and he's not only going before you, but he's clogging the wheels. And you know what that means? That what stood against you that affliction that adversity ooh, that stuckness that stuckness in your life that has kept your family and and your yourself and your beloved life from greatness and from glory hallelujah for years is being clogged and binded and sent back to hell in the name of jesus today the lord is binding the wheels so what worked against you, what, that, what snares were sent against you, and what traps lurked from the enemy is being binded. The Lord is binding the wheels. So there will be no more movement, no more movement, no more movement, no more movement of these principalities of darkness over the purpose he has for you. Because how many of you know in Jeremiah 29 and 11, he says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for hope and a future, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, baby. And so anything that doesn't agree with that promise, hallelujah, the Lord is binding the wheels of it. He's binding the wheels. So there's no more movement in that direction. And so when, when, mm, hallelujah, when the wheels on the chariot of darkness, addiction, stuckness, whatever you want to call it, when those are bound and clogged, right, then it causes you to be still because there's no more movement. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. He is causing a stillness because he's binding the wheels of what is driving you away from him. Hallelujah. He is binding the wheels of this. And in this stillness, right, that he is causing by his heavenly power, we get to know him. And when you know him, when you get to really know him and his love and his power, his sweetness, his humor, then it is your pleasure to repent to turn right from the direction where these dark chariots right were bringing you when those wheels are clogged and you're still and you're able to know him then you get to turn to him and you get to face him and behold his countenance his glory that he would smile upon you and you know what happens when you do that is you get to receive hallelujah mm that there would be no interception. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He is binding the wheels of interception. What, what, what stood in the way of you and his promises, of you and his love, of you and his glory? What stood in the way of you beholding this beautiful relationship that's available to you? He's binding the wheels of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I used to run track back in high school. And when someone was really fast, we would say, oh, that boy got wheels. Oh, she got wheels. <laughs> We'd be on the sideline like, oh, they got wheels. Meow. <laughs> and that represents speed, right? Wheels represent speed and movement and mobility and quickening and hastening, right? And these are tools of God. Like how many of you have heard the old saints say, well, I felt a quickening in my spirit. How many of you know the word of God in Habakkuk that says, my word hastens to the end. It quickens, y'all. It got wheels. His promise got wheels. He got wheels about you. He wants to quicken his promise in your life, right? But first what he has to do is bind the wheels. He has to clog the wheels of affliction, and so when this happens, hallelujah, I could stay here all day. I could praise him right here all day. Thank you, Jesus, for binding the wheels. You're binding it. You're clogging those wheels so there is no more unholy movement against me. Hallelujah. You better claim that for your family. You better claim that for your business. You better claim that for your ministry. You better claim that for your unborn child. You better claim it for your elders. You better claim that for your household. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ooh, thank you, Holy Spirit. 
he's putting wheels on your destiny. He's putting movement behind your purpose and your desire to please him, right? And so this is not, this is separate from our salvation. Our salvation is by grace and not by works, right? But we do get to serve him. And he's putting a quickening behind our desire to do that so that he can get the glory. Hallelujah. And in this season of transition, right, there is adversity that we face. And what the Lord is saying is that he is going, you'll see him fight for you and you'll see him do it in such a way that these Egyptians in your life, follow with me, these Egyptians, okay, these gossipers, these mockers, these scoffers, whatever you want to call them, right? They ain't going to have no choice but to one, speak God's word and God's promise concerning you right back to you. Oh, it's going to turn from what is she doing? What is he doing? To he really is anointed. <laughs> she really is anointed, right? Not only that, but they're not going to have a choice but to fold. They're not going to have a choice but to flee because the pressure is on. Because we are in a time where there is principalities at work. There is war. There is famine. There is adversity. And if you don't yield to have the power of the Lord clogging, binding the wheels of that in your life, then, you know, we're not strong enough to come against it. His power is made perfect in our weakness. We're weak enough to let him, right, do it for us, right? And so if you're not in alignment with that, then there's no choice but to fold and flee. And to that we say bye. <laughs> we pray in for him as always, but bye. Not everyone can come with you. The Israelites went to the promised land. Not everybody and they mama now, unfortunately. But this is your God. This not this is not Pastor Mina. This is what your God said. <laughs> Verse 26 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. Mm. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. Hallelujah. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. Because God said it three times. <laughs> because God said it, it happened, okay? Verse 29, but the Israelites, but the Israelites, culture makes us act a certain way. Culture will have people talking a certain way. Culture will have people consuming a certain substance. Culture will have you dress a certain way. Culture will have you saying a certain thing. Culture will have you speaking a certain song. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. Hallelujah. With a wall of water on the right and the left. With what could have took them out? What could have drowned them? What, what could have filled their lungs that needed the breath of life of God with water that would have killed them? What could have done that was to their right and to their left. What it doesn't say, what it doesn't say is that what could have took them out was before them, stopping them from glory. And what it also doesn't say is that what could have killed them was nowhere near. On the contrary, it, it was on their right and on their left. And so to us, in a practical sense, y'all, I, I got to make this practical for God's people. When you're following a word of God, it may look, when you look to your right, and when you look to your left, you may feel like you're in danger. <laughs> because what could good and well take you out is right there 
But where it's not is before you. Where it's not is even behind you because the Lord goes before you. The angel of the Lord is behind you, keeping you from anything getting you from behind and keeping you from getting from anything getting in the way of where you're going. Hallelujah. Verse 30, that, that day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. So what happened? What came up against God's chosen people was left dead on the shore. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was left dead on the shore. And God got what he set out to get, and that was the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ooh, let's pray, y'all. Jesus, right now we give you the glory, we give you the honor, we give you the praise. You're the same God that did it for Moses. Hey, 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 hey. You're the same God that's doing it for us. You're the same God that's doing it right now in this city, Lord, in this house, in this country, in this world, Lord. You are God over it all. There is one true God. Ooh, hallelujah. And he has so many names. Adonai, El Shaddai, Elohim, Elion, but we call him Emmanuel. We choose to say the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, that you sent your one and only son to atone for us, to be the ultimate sacrifice on the cross, risen, Lord. He finished it. He settled the score. He paid the price so that we could stand before you today, not just as your children, but as a pleasing aroma to you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're doing it over your children right now. You're gathering young girls to yourself who will one day grow to be women of God. You're gathering young boys to yourself who will one day grow to be men of God. You are sovereign over the next generation and you're sovereign over all of us here today. Lord, we give you the glory, we give you the praise. We'll never get tired of shouting and praising for you. Hallelujah. We will stomp and we will praise right here, right here on this ground, right here in the middle of this seat, right in this transition, right in the face of this adversity, because your glory shines upon us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for your text. Thank you, Lord, for the Bible because it's true, because it holds your promises and it speaks of your love for all of your children. You love us, Lord. And we see that reflected in the text. We feel it, Lord. It is embodied by Jesus and Jesus left his spirit to live in us. So Lord, we ask that we could just embody your word as we go throughout our day so we could body this day so we could body this world god hallelujah so that any trial right that we would be more than conquerors over it because your spirit god resides in us thank you jesus for what you're doing thank you for your closeness and thank you for this church god do a mighty and miraculous thing in us do a wonderful thing in us because that's who you are that's your character, God. We love you and we adore you today. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. That no trap of the evil one would trip us up, Lord, because you go before us and that you got our back, Lord. So we're going to keep doing what you need us to do. We're going to follow your guidance. We're going to be obedient to the day of completion when Jesus comes back. Hallelujah. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.